The next speaker, uh, CMOM, simplifying the scary sounding acronym by Deborah Mahoney of Hazen and Sawyer. Um, is Deborah here? There she is. All right. Um, Deborah is an associate with Hazen Sawyer and has worked with, in the wastewater industry for over 20 years. She has her uh, bachelor's degree in civil engineering and MBA from UMass Lowell. Her experiences ranged from wastewater uh, treatment plant designs and upgrades to CMMS uh, um, evaluations and asset management planning. Um, but a real passion is uh, the CMOM program, so I'm anxious to hear, uh, see this presentation. All right, good afternoon, or actually late morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk to you about CMOM. Um, I don't know how many of you have actually heard that acronym, understand what it is, um, understand the program that's around it. How many people have heard of CMOM? How many people actually know what it is? Oh, good. That's awesome. Good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help um, kind of decipher what CMOM is and help you um, understand how to get your program started if you don't already have it. Um, so I'm going to also talk to you about why considering a CMOM program. Um, and I'm um, not going to talk to you about asset management. Uh, we, that's a, another topic for another day. Um, so really, the CMOM... CMOM came about, um, it stands for Capacity Management, Operations and Maintenance. Um, the MOM part of it originated with EPA Region 4 um, as a goal to eliminate sanitary sewer overflows in our system um, by improving operational efficiencies to be proactive versus reactive in maintaining our collection systems. Uh, the C part stands for capacity. It was added to the program um, to investigate the capacity of uh, and constrained areas within the system. And the reasons for uh, capacity constraints or constr SSOs are things like blockages, uh, structural de uh, defects in your pipes, mechanical issues at the pump stations, uh, electrical failures, collapse broken sewer pipes, all these kind of aging infrastructure issues and I&I &I infiltration inflow. Um, all of these things can be prevented with good preventative maintenance. And that is, is really the crux of where the CMOM program came out, is, is the EPA felt like if, if people spent more time on preventative maintenance, we'd have less sanitary sewer overflows um, to report. So the program does cover sewer pipes, manholes, pump stations, everything within your collection system. Um, and again, it's intended to help communities be proactive versus reactive. And we know that there's cost constraints that go along with that and that sometimes we're forced to be reactive versus proactive. But this program is put in place to try to help you explain to the ratepayers, explain to the people that um, you, know, you have to report your budgets to that this program will help you identify the costs that really go along with uh, preventative maintenance and why it's important, because um, it's actually more expensive when you're reacting to a problem than when you're uh, being proactive maintaining your system. Um, so this incorporate, this actually goes back to the 2000 with the, um, in the proposed SSO rule, but was never promulgated. So since then, um, since there's no federal requirement, um, many states have been putting CMOM programs in, in their permits. Um, now what we're seeing really is um, the EPA was trying to make CMOM mandatory uh, for MIP NIPTES permits, but it's currently uh, delegated states that are really getting them in the NIPTES permits, where Connecticut being, an, um, un I mean, a delegated state versus an undelegated state. So we're seeing New Hampshire and Mass, um, because EPA is writing their permits, they're actually, all those permits are seeing CMOM requirements in there. And it may not actually say CMOM in the permit. It may just say operation and maintenance manual or O&M of your uh, collection system. Um, but they are pushing um, other states into including them in, in their permits. Um, I know for DEEP that it's, um, you know, during your facility evaluations, when they come and, and, and uh, meet with you, they're, they're going to be looking at um, 
you know, potentially four treatment plants a year. They'll be visiting when they do your facility assessment. They will bring up, you know, what do you have for documentation on O&M of your collection system? And we do want to see you start looking at O&M of your collection system. So you will see that if you don't already, if you haven't already talked to your, your regulators, you will start hearing more about it and you will start seeing a little bit more requirements, not that they're actually going to be um, full-fledged in, in your NIFTES permit, but they might be. And then, and then as we heard this morning, the general permit um, for folks that don't have NIFTES permits or, or, or uh, satellite communities will also have these O&M uh, CMOM requirements. So why should you even consider one even if you, you don't think you need to? Uh, well, again, we, we know in the Northeast that we have all these old pipes, we have aging infrastructure that really needs to be uh, maintained better. We have uh, brittle material, a lot of vitrified clay pipe. We have uh, pipes that are up here, uh, up of like 100 years old around here. Um, and years and years of debris in those pipes. Even if they're structurally sound, you'll have a lot of debris in some of these pipes, whether it's fats, oils, and grease, or whether it's tree roots, um, or whether you know, it's just normal uh, wipes or other, other debris. Um, and then obviously a reason to look at this is to eliminate sanitary sewer overflows, which was the real intent of the program. Um, also, this program, um, like I said before, it's really going to help you mitigate costs and plan spending. You know, I, you'd rather be able to find a problem through CCTV and address it immediately than having to find a collapsed pipe that's 20 feet deep next to a riverbed, you know, in the middle of winter time that all of a sudden now the costs are going to be astronomically higher to, to, to fix that. Um, so that and then obviously to ensure regulatory compliance. Um, so the key components of a CMOM program, first and foremost, is to document your existing um, protocols, your SOPs, what you currently have. Um, and, and a lot of you probably already have a lot of this documentation of, of how you clean your, go about cleaning your sewers, how often you clean your sewers, how often um, do you um, go out and CCTV your lines? Uh, what are your protocols for, um, for any cross-country easements and maintaining those easements? What do you do for fats, oils, and grease and roots? And, and those, are, um, those are really important to have in one place. And um, as we heard earlier, we are all going to, electronic, um, to an electronic database and, and putting all this stuff in an electronically in one location to easily access them um, rather than having paper copies of O&M procedures and SOPs all over the, all over the place. Um, and then the next thing about a, uh, the key component is to work on modifying those, those programs, those SOPs, those elements. See what, what are old, what are things you've been doing for years and years that maybe just don't work and, and look at changing them. Um, and then also develop um, implementation plans uh, for those solutions, for those. So just some easy ways to start. There's a lot of things you can do yourself to start your CMOM program. And one of them is to conduct a self-assessment. And EPA has a nice checklist that you can go through. And it's, it's not a one-size-fits-all. It's, it's really go through the checklist. Some of it applies to you. Some may not apply to you. Um, and it gives you a kind of an idea of where you stand with your CMOM program, where you stand with operating and maintaining your collection system, and where you have gaps. Um, and that's the next part, is developing that gap analysis of what are you missing that you may not have thought about or you may have not had time to invest in. Um, and from that, you develop an operation and maintenance manual for your collection system. Um, and that is with, like we talked about, with all your SOPs and, and your procedures now, um, complemented with working on those gaps that you did have, um, uh, that were missing. And then planning and scheduling programs around your CMOM, whether it's CCTV, whether it's cleaning programs, whether it's safety. Um, and then you implement and measure them. So the first, like I said, is the self-evaluation. And um, 
EPA Region 4 really did a great job with preparing um, this, this documentation. They're the first ones that really dive, dove deep, um, head first into this. Um, and it's just really easy. You're not going to be able to read these, unfortunately. Um, but they're, they're really just documenting, for example, how many linear feet of pipe you have. What materials of pipe do you have? Um, what size diameter, what diameter pipe do you have? And really just going through and making sure that you understand your own collection system. Um, and it, again, it's not a one size fits all, so you don't have to feel like you have to answer every single thing within this EPA checklist. Um, and DEEP is not going to fault you if you're missing something. They just want to know that you're actually doing something, that you're actually looking at your collection system in this way. So here's another example, pipe diameter, pipe materials. Um, training, training is a big aspect. How much training do you do? You know, whether it's um, how to use the correct nozzles when you're training your staff and cleaning, you know, using the vac on truck and cleaning the collection system, or whether it's confined space entry training. Um, how often do you do it and how many people get trained and keeping track of those records. Um, and system mapping, GIS. Um, GIS is a big tool that's, that's um, used for understanding and maintaining your collection system. So those are just some of the pages. There's a lot more pages that you can go through and they're very simple pages. Um, and then from that, you will find out where your gaps are. You will understand, oh, I don't have this and it's okay because it doesn't affect my system or I don't have this and we really should start looking at this type of program. Um, and there's many ways to do a gap analysis. The larger your system, the, the, you know, the, more, or the more gaps you have, the more you want to prioritize which, what you want to focus on because obviously you don't have time and money to focus on all your gaps right away. If you don't have a root control program and you don't have a fog program and you don't do CCTV work, well, you don't have the money and the time to do that all at one whack. So prioritiz prioritization of, okay, where do we want to focus first and um, wh what's second, what's third, and, and making sure that you have a game plan going forward. Um, so then um, with those gaps, obviously we're talking about uh, the simple thing that you can start with is the O&M manual. Taking what you did for the self-assessment, taking the gap analysis, and putting those SOPs, putting everything into one O&M manual. Um, this should be a dynamic, flexible manual that is ever-changing. It shouldn't be a hard copy sitting on a shelf. It should be something people use regularly. It should be changed regularly. You're always changing SOPs. You're always changing um, and, and coming up with better ideas of how you do things. So you should always be updating this. Um, so some of the parts of the o and manual and some of the parts of CMOM uh, starting with management, so the um, first M. Um, so we'll be looking at, you know, organizational structure, um, training, uh, communications, customer service. When you get a complaint in, how, what's that process like? When somebody receives that first phone call, who gets that phone call? And then from that phone call, how does the work order get produced? Do you have a CMMS system? Do you just have a paper system? Documenting those types of procedures are, are really important for your workforce and it's really important for you and um, maintaining your collection system. Um, we talked about CMMS for management information systems and GIS, um, um, SSO notification, how do you currently notify um, regulators or who, who's the person that's going to be notifying people if you have an SSO? Who, who has that responsibility? What kind of paperwork do they need to fill out? Um, legal authority, sewer ordinances, fats, oils, and grease. All of this is management. Who's, who's in charge of doing what? And let's document that. The next is the O, operations. Um, so a lot of the things that we address in the operations side of things is budgeting, making sure you have the budget for not only staff, um, but also for um, your, the work that you need to do, cleaning your sewers, doing the CCTV work, if that's what you do. Um, for uh, compliance, 
for H2S monitoring and corrosion control, uh, safety and emergency responses. Uh, there's all kinds of SOPs that go along with that. And really, um, you may have a lot of institutional knowledge of, oh, well, you know, George does that every day. You know, I don't have to worry about that because he does it. Well, what happens when George goes? Who knows the protocols? Who knows the procedures and the best management practices? So it's really important. Um, the first step is just the documentation and creating this O&M manual. Uh, engineering is one that we talk about a lot too because if you have new contractors that are coming into town and they're trying to you know, uh, put in a low pressure sewer system, do you have plans and specs already, already developed, standardized? Where are those plans and specs? What is your coordination with new, new contractors that come in or new entities that come in and want to build a development? Um, pump stations. Um, like I said, pump stations is a big part of the collection system. So it's really important to document how many, how, how many of your pump stations have emergency generators, how many um, uh, pump stations have visits every day from staff, every two days, once a week, uh, documenting who, who visits and how frequently they visit, um, looking at the record keeping for those pump stations. Is that kept in the pump station or do you keep that someplace else? Is that finally on elect electronically online or does somebody have to come into the office, put it, you know, type it into a spreadsheet? And um, it's important to have an understanding of, of who does what and what, what they do. So the M, uh, the other M, maintenance, um, this is where we get into a lot of the CCTV work and cleaning. Um, scheduling uh, via CMMS, if you have a CMMS system that schedules work orders, that schedules the cl cleaning of your pipes, um, and developing a plan and schedule of, of those. So. One of the things that we like to do is a continuous sewer um, assessment program. And so a big part of understanding what shape your sewer is in, structurally and operationally, is by doing a CCTV program. So if you're not already doing a CCTV program, I would really strongly encourage that you start one. Um, and that doesn't mean you have to sewer the uh, CCTV, the entire sewer in, in, in a year. You can space it out as long as you want. But what you can do is a priority assessment of, of your collection system and determine, um, based on consequence of failure and probability of failure, where your most critical areas to CCTV first. And then depending on your budget and your time, um, space that out over a number of years. And you know if, if you want to focus on um, pipes that are near uh, hospitals, near schools, pipes that are 20 feet deep, pipes made of vitrified clay. Um, those kind of things take priority maybe over a system that was just built in the 90s with PVC. So, um, but at the end of the day, you wanna be able to CCTV your entire system um, continuously. So whether it's a 10 year cycle, 20 year cycle, five year cycle, it's a continuous process. Because even if you have a PVC pipe, um, who's to say that you don't have a, a fog problem? Who's to say that there's not operational issues within that pipe because of something else? So developing a plan and scheduling the CCTV, um, it's important to make sure if you don't, whether you do it in-house or sub it out, that you have standardizations. Um, when we talked about training before, we talk about things like PACP training and the NASCO PACP training which is really important. And that's a good way to make sure that any company that you use, whether it's internally or hired out, is looking at your pipes the same way, that's scoring and ranking them the same way. And from that, that's where we recommend improvements, right? So if we see something, you know, maybe it's just cutting a tree root, or maybe there's a collapsed pipe, pipe and now we need to address it immediately, um, at least we know before some catastrophic issue, before the, the road sinks, before we get a call from the hospital that there's a blockage and they, they don't, you know, it's backing up into to their OR, you know? So um, CCTV is such a critical component of uh, being proactive with your collection system and, 
and uh, the CMOM program. Uh, for example, one of the other things that we're doing is really using uh, Power BI and business intelligence systems to really dashboard all this information for us. So for CCTV programs such as the one we did in Nantucket, um, it's really easy for the client to be able to pull this up and say, you know, oh, okay, this was CCTV, this is when it was CCTV, this is the results of the CCTV, I see that it's you know, there's a root blockage or there's, um, you know, offset joint, whatever, and, and then we can make decisions together based on that. So now you have your CMOM program. You have your own M manual, you did your gap analysis, and you start talking about what you want to do as far as CCTV, infiltration inflow, all those types of FOG programs. Um, now you need to implement it and measure it. So this is an example of one that we did, uh, one of our first ones quite a while ago, back in 2008. And you can see just from O&M related overflows from year one to year five went down um, over 73% just from being proactive with our maintenance, being, doing preventative maintenance. And again, when you look at costs for foot renewed, um, you know, I, it's just, we all know that if you have an emergency repair, how costly that is compared to if you're planning, right? Um, you know, if, if you have a collapsed road versus being able to excavate on your own time, um, it, prices, uh, obviously, costs are, are a lot different. So in closing, the, the takeaways are um, a CMOM program is continuous. It's a continuous loop. You're, you're acting, you're planning, you're doing, you're checking. And it's continuous because your sewer system is being continuously used. It's changing. It's ever-changing depending on what Joe Schmo, the, you know, ho the household um, over on the end of the street, what they're flushing down, or what the hospital's flushing down the drain, or if there's a big tree growing, or you know, any number of things changes our collection system daily. So this is not just a one and done. This is a continuous program. It's like a new change of, of the way we look at our business. Um, and, and it's helpful to, um, to have all our SOPs documented in one place, some place that everyone can access it, and, um, and focus, on, um, focus on preventative maintenance. So the keys to uh, CMOM's success is obviously reducing sanitary sewer overflow since that was the main driver of this entire program from the beginning. Um, and improve public trust. When you don't have sanitary sewer overflows, the, the public's happy, nobody's impacted, you know, what they, you know, it's, it, what's underground, and they don't see it, they don't, they're happy. Um, documenting your SOPs, BMPs, and emergency response, um, again, with the aging workforce, it's really important to get that institutional knowledge down on paper in one place. It's really important to make sure that the younger generation, the new generation coming up, knows what SOPs are out there and what they should be doing. Um, capturing, uh, collecting, managing, and organizing your data. We are in an area of big data, right? We're getting SCADA data. We're getting um, information from GIS. We're getting information from our CMMS. Um, trying to make sure that we capture all that information and all that data in one place is really important. And then finally, um, I'm not going to talk about asset management today, but um, CMOM program goes ha hand in hand with asset management planning, um, which is a, a big driver for developing CIPs and controlling your costs and really organizing your costs over a period of time and getting buy-in by the ratepayers. So with that, um, there's a few guidance documents that I put up there that, you, you know, will help you get going. And if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Any questions? Yeah, yep. Yeah, so Power BI, there's a lot of different BI products, business intelligence products, 
Power BI is a Microsoft project, uh, Microsoft product. So if, you're, if you have a computer that's Microsoft, um, you can download it for free. It's a, it's a free product. Um, and so it's really, it's a, it's a dashboard. So you're taking data, whether it's from Excel or from GIS or from SCADA, and you're actually just creating these dashboards with it so that you can see all your data in one place. It's, it's a really neat and powerful tool and we're really seeing it um, uh, be very helpful in a lot of different ways, uh, both on the treatment plant side and collections. Any other questions? Thank you.